All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I'm really excited about our conversation this evening. My name is Peter Hula. Now I'll call this a series, Tropical Thursdays, a partnership between XPRIZE and um, the Natural History Museum in LA. And tonight is a very exciting um, topic of discussion because we get to talk about how do museum collections help us travel through time. And I will be joined by Trina Roberts, uh, Associate Vice President of four collections. Um, as Associate Vice President for Collections, Trina works with staff and all departments to improve and advocate for the three museum's incredible collections. Uh, she was introduced to museum collections as a graduate student at the Field Museum of Natural History and the University of Chicago, where she earned a PhD in evolutionary biology in 2005. She has studied the relationship between evolution and geography in groups of mammals, including fruit bats and tree shrews, she worked at the University of Alaska Museum, National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, and University of Iowa Pentecost Museums before joining the Natural History Museum in 2018. We are also joined by Allison Schultz, uh, Assistant Curator of Ornithology. Allison is an ornithologist who integrates research across evolutionary timescales to gain an understanding of the processes that produce the patterns of biodiversity. She is assistant curator of ornithology at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And tonight, as I said, we'll be talking about how do museum collections help us travel through time. Again, my name is Peter Houlihan. I am the technical lead for the Rainforest X Prize also based in LA. And the Rainforest X Prize is a five year $10 million competition to revolutionize the way that biodiversity is surveyed in tropical rainforest um, using novel technologies to advance uh, the urgency and the remoteness and the autonomous ways that uh, rainforest can be surveyed for conservation action. Now, Natural History Museum collections aren't just what's on display in exhibit halls as libraries of the world's current and past biological diversity, research collections are a critical way scientists study and understand the species we share the planet with. Allison Schultz and Trina Roberts will show tonight how collections help us travel in time to learn about other species and how they and their habitats have changed and how that can help us to do some additional time travel into the future. We will all discuss uh, collections, but they specifically will discuss the Natural History Museum's collection fits, how it fits into the worldwide effort to document and archive biodiversity, and how our approach to collections is changing as we develop more inclusive and equitable practices in museums and in science. Um, and for me, I'm also particularly thrilled about this conversation. I myself was based at the Florida Museum of Natural History for a number of years, and so we've all worked um, in collections and have uh, a lot to share. So I think it's gonna be a fun conversation. And um, personally, I'm, I'm excited because um, uh, many people that visit natural history museums don't realize that the public displays are only a fraction of what exists at natural history museums. And um, so tonight we'll talk a little bit about the behind the scenes, something that uh, most of the public has no idea is behind those walls, but is instrumental to research and advancing all sorts of science in these fields. So without further ado, I'd love to uh, have Trina and Allison both say a hello and um, yeah, and we can go from there. Thanks, Peter. Um, Hi, I'm Trina Roberts. Um, I'm looking forward to this discussion. Hi, I'm Allison Schultz, and I'm also looking forward to this discussion and kind of getting everybody thinking about natural history museums and collections and how they maybe could be integrated into some of these ideas that everybody has. Great. So I think a fun way to start might be to 
explain, you know, this realm of collections behind the scenes. Uh, what does that look like at the Natural History Museum in LA? Here you can see a little bit of the scene outside. Um, how many, how many uh, specimens do you have in your collections? What do those collections look like? And um, what's your favorite part of them? Well, so we, we usually claim um, that we have about 35 million objects and specimens in our collection. Um, and the secret is that we don't really know because there's no single way to count. Um, some of those things are one bird skin. Some of those things are one jar of fish, which could be counted as one or 10, depending. Um, some of those things are probably one bird skin with some lice still on it, which might be one or more, depending on how you're counting. Um, but so the, the total number of 35 million, I think everybody would agree is a very large number um, and not what you see if you visit the museum um, and just look at exhibits. And that's because these are the things that are meant for scientific research, um, not for display. Um, our 35 million also includes a lot of history and anthropology, which we're not going to talk about today, but which are an important part of museum collections and how we learn about the world, too. Exactly. Just to maybe, you know, bring in the bird collection, you know, that's my specialty here, but we've got about 122,000 bird specimens in the museum. So a relatively small collection compared to some of the other collections in the museum, but in some ways, one of the better documented ones, you know, we know really exactly how many bird skins we have and they're all in our electronic database, which I think we'll talk a little bit more later. And they're very data rich, which is really important for a lot of the research that we do. And I'm definitely looking forward to getting into that conversation, but I can't help but point out the image on the screen right now. Um, could you explain a little bit, well, explain as much as you want about this exact image, what it represents, and the uniqueness of Oh, sorry, I think I just cut out there for a moment. Um, but I was just asking if you could explain a little bit about the La Brea tar pits here and the uniqueness of the collections that uh, you all have from this site. Yeah, so the, the Natural History Museums are a family of museums, and that includes the Natural History Museum of LA County, which is an exposition park, and also the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum, which you're looking at an external image of now. Also the Hart Museum up in Santa Clarita, um, which again is a more a history resource than a natural history resource. This um, Tar Pits site is a great example of one of the ways that museum collections can help us travel through time. Um, so this is a way of looking at what LA was like, not just today through the specimens that we can collect now, you know, modern birds or modern insects, but looking at plants and animals that existed here deeper into the past. Um, so this is, you know, this iconic image of mammoths getting stuck in the lake pit outside the tar pits. Um, is an example of how we might then end up with a mammoth in the collection, you know, 20,000 years later or several hundred thousand years later. It's amazing. And I think when we were talking previously, you were mentioning the sheer number of skeletons that you have. What was that number, <laughs> roughly? I do not remember how many skeletons that we have from the tar pits. It's, a, it's again, a, a huge number. Um, Allison can maybe compare that to like the, the modern bird skeletons, which we also talked about. Yeah, you know, oftentimes when people think of the tar pits, they think of the, you know, the, the mammoths, the saber-toothed tigers and all of the, you know, the big animals that got stuck there. But actually there's a ton of, of smaller fossils as well that we can pull out, for example, bird material. So we've got, I, I think we don't even really know how many bird fossils there are, but I've heard several hundred thousand to a million bird fossils, many of which are unidentified. We don't even know what kind of bird that they come from. And, um, the, you know, the tar pits right now, many of the creators have a big project right now to actually look at microfossils. You know, we're talking about things that, you know, like little rodent teeth, for example, or even um, pollen spores. There's, there, you know, there, there's a lot more than meets the eye in terms of these kind of big fossils compared to what we can get that are, are much smaller. I think if you maybe go forward one slide, 
um, this is this is more an image that represents what museum collections look like as opposed to the you know the, the nice lake pit mammoth image. As you think about collections, think about um, how much replication we have if we have 35 million objects and specimens. But you can see here is that that's not just one of one kind of bird. That's drawers and drawers of some kinds of birds in this case. This is a, an image from our bird collection that Allison is in charge of. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I always get the question, how many birds will be enough bird? Like, when will you have enough of every species? And the answer is really never, because it's these series of specimens that make our collection so valuable, because each one of these specimens was collected at a particular point, place, at a particular point in time. And so it's going to be unique because, you know, as time marches on, the animal might change in that location. And so in that way, you know, each of these collections are, are time machines into the past, as you know, we kind of hinted at in, our, in the title of our talk. And, and not just time machines to particular dates, but particular locations as well. That just yep. opens the door for the rest of the whole night. Sorry, go ahead, Trina. <laughs> I was going to say we are we are also lending libraries, which is the, another another analogy we use often. Um, so one of the reasons we have these obviously is for Allison to do her research and for our own curators, but also for scientists around the world. And we we loan specimens. We literally put bird skins in a box and ship them to to scientists and other institutions, um, and act as an interlibrary loan, as do all the other natural history museums in the world. So something else to think of as we show you what our collections look like is that those are being used worldwide to answer all kinds of different questions. Um, and they're available to anyone who needs scientific specimens to answer their question. And how far back in time do some of these specimens uh, go to? So these, you know, in terms of like modern specimens, um, Trina can collect, correct me if I'm wrong for other collections, but at least in the birds, um, I believe 1840s are our very oldest bird skin specimen. We have quite a few collected in Los Angeles area around the turn of the century and then kind of through time from there. Um, different types of specimens will preserve, you know, better or worse and different aspects of, of of the organism. So in this case, this is a bird. What we're seeing now are bird skin specimens. So basically, the skin and the feathers stuffed with cotton, so none of the insides, but we have other types of specimens that preserve, you know, other inside parts as well. Um, and, and, and of course we have fossils from, that are much, much older from this, either from the La Brea Tar Pits, where we, you know, getting into like tens to hundreds of thousands of years old, or other types of fossils where we're getting into, you know, millions of years old. So really many different time series. Yeah, if you, if you go forward one, so this is, a, this is an example of that deep time element of museum collections traveling in time. So of course, something like the bird collection maybe helps us travel in time 20 years, 50 years, 150 years back. What you're looking at now is an image from our invertebrate paleontology collection. Um, this is an image of a fly um, from a geologic formation in Germany. This is 25 million years into the past. Um, what I love about these fossils from the, our Invert Paleo collection, these were digitized with a National Science Foundation grant. What I love about these is that I can look at that and say, wow, that's a fly. Um, this is fantastic preservation. This is a, a fantastic fossil site with a huge number of insects and other invertebrates. And that can tell us something about the habitat 25 million years ago in that location. So we've got these different time slices where a collection like the bird collection is helping us look at maybe a, a decade or century, couple of centuries time scale. Something like the tar pits is in the, on the order of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. And then these deeper fossil collections and mineral collections might help us look at the world and the earth itself into the, the millions of years. And so you mentioned one thing right there about uh, digitizing can you speak a little bit to the importance of digitizing collections, how that makes them more accessible, what types of research can be done through that type of work? Yeah, so, you know, there, there are different types of digitization. So, you know, what we're seeing here is when we actually can take a photograph of the specimen. And so, you know, a researcher um, 
in, in um, anywhere, you know, Germany where these were found or Australia or South, somewhere in South America, maybe Brazil can, you know, go and take some measurements and actually, you know, conduct analyses from this image. But most of our museum collections, while we're looking to get them digitized in this way, um, are actually digitized in a different way, which is actually the data associated with the specimen. So, and th those that are also really important. So for example, where that specimen was collected and when that specimen was collected are, are available on digital databases. Um, we upload our data to these kind of meta aggregators. One's called um, GBIF, um, what's that? Global, Global, Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Yes, we never refer to it as its actual name, but um, and you know this is where all many many different museums from around the world who also have digitized their collections will all upload their data to this museum, and so you can actually get you know we all have kind of specializations and where and when our collections are from. We don't really compete with each other, but you know taken together you can actually gain some really interesting insights into looking at you know using these records to look at how distributions have changed um, you can start to combine these records with other types of data say data on climate during that particular time and then build models you know what what where do what climate does this species need to live in and then even project that forward into the future as the climate changes can we you know model what we think this species might do for example yeah, this, this effort to digitize does partly include images like this one, and that um, can be useful to scientists who, you know, this, this is such a high quality image that you could probably actually do some measurement on it without shipping a delicate specimen around the world. So this makes the specimen more accessible to researchers if they can use the image of it um, and makes it better for the preservation of the specimen because we have to handle it less to use it. Um, but that data that Allison's talking about is really where we get in museums connecting to the world of big data and big data analysis. And that's really, really exciting because it brings together this whole kind of worldwide collection um, and all the data that's coming out of all the natural history museums in the world and lets us see how those relate to each other rather than being little individual units. Um, you know, 50 years ago, it would have been extremely difficult to look at the, all the holdings of even one museum, let alone 10 museums all at once. And now we can do that, you know, with the, the click of a mouse button, basically. Absolutely. And it really opens up the amount of research that can be done. I, I know that all of us have spent a lot of time in the field collecting um, for our own research at different times, uh, specimens, but once they're in collections, a lot of that work has been done for a long period of time. And so being able to maximize the amount of research that's done on what you have um, really extends the, the life in a scientific sense <laughs> of, of the specimens that you have. Um, yeah, so thinking, about, thinking about places like rainforests that are delicate and difficult to get to and often difficult to get into and can come with hazards, particularly when we're talking about specimens that were collected um, for, you know, on a, a previous expedition, we want those to get used over and over again. Like why not maximize the information? We don't want scientists to have to go back every time, mount a new expensive expedition. It's much, much better for all of us if we have collections that are able to provide that as a, as a resource for the whole community. Exactly. And if we just can advance one more slide, we'll actually show an example of how you know, on each of these specimens, some of the data that can be associated. So these are some white cheeked taracos, my favorite birds, um, purposely photographed for that. And so you can see each of these specimens has a little tag tied to its feet. And this tag on one side will say the specimen name and our museum collection number. And on the other side, we can see all sorts of information. You know, this specimen was collected in this particular site in Kenya. It's a female, its ovary was enlarged, which means that it was in breeding conditions. We actually can start to learn something about the biology of these organisms as well. You know, it was collected September 12th. Oh man, that was almost like to the day, um, the collection well day of the specimen. Yeah, yeah. 1969 at 7,000 feet elevation. Um, and, you know, we actually have a weight here and we have what, what was in its stomach contents had fruit. So, you know, there are other types of data as well as just location and, and date and time 
um, that that also can be used for some data analyses. And you know, there are some kind of really big efforts in trying to understand, for example, you know, across all birds, you know, how has maybe diet correlated with some other traits like color, for example. Um, and so specimens are a really rich resource for all sorts of things, even without analyzing the specimen themselves, just for analyzing all of the data associated with them. The, this image also um, leads to another point about digitizing specimens, because if you look at that tag, this one at least is partially typed. And maybe we could scan that tag and do some optical character recognition and automate some text recovery from those tags. But if you think about a museum collection that's been built over the past 150 years, for much of that period, these tags are handwritten. Um, and this is good handwriting compared to some of the tags um, that you'll find in museum collections. So much of what museums are doing in trying to get these data online and create this great big data resource is transcribing historic records. We have collection records, we have historic ledgers where specimens were written down one by one on the pages, basically on the pages of a big book. Um, we have tags with really interesting information that if it's only on the tag is not accessible to anyone. So there's a huge effort underway in, in many, many museum collections to digitize all of this data as well as the basic, what is it, where was it, when was it, get those into databases, link all that up, um, make some really exciting cross-linked uh, resources for all of us to use. For all of us and internationally. So something we've talked a bit about is that especially tropical rainforests for such a long period of time, um, you know, the most biodiverse places on the planet had the least amount of their own specimens, their own collections that represented where that biodiversity comes from. They were taken to institutions abroad. And so essentially what you're doing now, and even with the barcoding of these tags and the digitizing, um, really starts to begin to make these accessible internationally so that even more researchers can uh, benefit and study from, from these collections. Absolutely, yeah, you know, one of our goals is really to, to um, you know, what we call decolonize museums, which is to make the specimens and the data as widely available as we can, especially in these places where these specimens were collected from. Um, another, you know, just thing to mention is that um, these specimens, it says collected by K.E. Steger. And so, you know, one one thing also that we're, we're trying to do is really also recognize the different people who actually participated in these expeditions. Um, you know, this Ken Steger, he was the curator, so he was the lead, but there are many, many other participants, especially people from those local communities who are not getting the recognition that they deserve for these different efforts. There's, there's a lot of history to learn from these labels. And I always remembered going through um, when we'd be accessioning, you were, you were commenting about how difficult it is to actually know how many specimens you have, because I'm familiar with, you know, collections coming in and in massive numbers, more faster or in larger quantities than you can keep up with. Um, but going through these labels and for an individual geographical location, seeing things, I always remembered, you know, seeing the Belgian Congo or Zaire or um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and all of those aspects, talking about decolonizing museums and conservation, um, you really need to understand where these specimens came from and um, what that history is. And so I think it's, um, it's great work that's being done right now to really make these accessible uh, in a larger way and for the research to be done internationally and collaboratively. Doing. Um, one, one question that I have in seeing these, I know Allison, this is uh, one of your favorite parts of the museum in terms of collections. Um, Trina, do you have a favorite part of the collections at the LA Museum? Oh, I, I can't really choose. Um, I, I don't belong to any one of our departments, so it wouldn't be fair. And there's, um, there's amazing stuff in every single one of our collections and I learned something new every time I visit one of our collections. Um, I do have a weak point for bats, of course, because I did my dissertation on them. 
Um, we had a we had a bat image that Allison took for me that didn't actually make it into our slides. But not just any bats. Small small fruit bats are my bats. And and you did your work in the Philippines, is that right? Yeah, a, a I, I I worked on um, small fruit bats. Um, among islands in the Philippines. I'm very interested in, in geography, which is one of the things, obviously, that this, this time traveling, space traveling museum um, collection is good for, is looking at patterns across space and across time. So I'm, I'm very interested in patterns of um, how genetics changes across geography. So I was looking at that. Do either of you in your uh, field work have particular stories about collections that, that jump out in terms of, um, I don't know, I feel like we've all experienced so much in that part of it. And you think about seeing many of these collections and what goes into um, that work. And I think that those kinds of experiences are data in themselves um, that doesn't always get transcribed. And so, Sorry, go ahead, Trina. <laughs> yeah, reading reading field notes from past expeditions. Um, there's a there's a long history in field biology of people writing field notes, kind of as if they're they're maybe a journal entry of what was going on, and just recording the trip, not just the the little data points for each specimen. And those are like rollicking travelogues um, in many situations where there's natural disasters and all kinds of things that happen. Um, it, it really makes you think looking at these specimens of other reasons that we need to preserve them and treat them with care because um, blood, toil, tears, and sweat doesn't even cover what went into collecting these. Um, and the, the whole teams of people who are in the field to create a drawer of specimens like that, we need to respect their work and make sure that it's valued now as well. And get the most out of it as possible. Uh, right. You know, a, lot of, a lot of work done now um, with like the Rainforest X Prize, what we're really incentivizing is for technology to autonomously survey biodiversity um, rapidly and, and also increase the speed at which data can be analyzed. Um, but for these massive libraries, these massive resources that are available, so much. And um, so I, I just think that uh, there's so much to learn from them. And, and one thing that I really wanna ask is, we're talking about the history and going back in time, but what can we learn about the future from, from the history of what you have behind the scenes at the museum? Yeah, so, you know, when, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one thing that it, many biologists are doing is to look at, to correlate um, different factors in terms of where these specimens were collected, you know, whether those be climate factors or maybe making inference, you know, some of these times, sometimes you can link them to historical photos or people would go back and take photos in these places where they were. And then to build models and then, you know, given different climate projections actually project into the future, how we think that these organisms might survive, you know, given a certain climate parameter, you know, how given X degrees global warming, you know, we expect the environment to change like this. And so this might be how these organisms survive. Another thing to mention is that, you know, we, I, so I'm, I'm really an evolutionary biologist and evolution doesn't just happen on the scale of thousands or millions of years, but actually it happens on the scale of, of decades. And, you know, even in, in a single year, depending on, you know, what has occurred. And so, you know, we can learn a lot about how, how evolution can happen. And um, so, for example, you know, especially in a place like urban areas, you know, here in Los Angeles, the habitat is changing so quickly, just like it is in many rainforests. You know, we can use these specimens to go back in time from a, um, I often do it from a genetic perspective, we can actually get DNA from all these specimens and look at, okay, how, how quickly can evolution happen? You know, how does it occur? Um, how much genetic diversity do, do these organisms need to have in order to survive into the future? And so those are just some of the, you know, many, many types of questions and ways that we can actually apply new technologies to these specimens to kind of look forward into the future um, and, and try and, and, you know, not just use specimens as time machines going back, but also going forward. 
What kinds of uh, genetic collections do you have uh, at the museum? Several of our collections have um, kind of sub collections of tissue samples. So little pieces of muscle or liver or you know, different kinds of, of animal tissues that were collected specifically for genetic analysis. On top of that, you can actually get DNA from something like the bird study skins that you're looking at here or from, from mammal study skins, um, any, any of those kind of dry collections. So we have things that were preserved in ways that allow us to take DNA, even if that wasn't the actual, the original intent of the collector. We also have things that were collected with that specifically in mind. Obviously, those are mostly more recent. Um, collections from you know, 1880, nobody was collecting with DNA in mind. We are lucky that that works, um, but it does, it does work and it makes our collections an even deeper and richer resource for this kind of research. Absolutely, and, and interestingly, I mean, the previous, one of the earlier photos of the fossil, that also layers into the genetic cap um, being able to date collections, being able to date genetic, uh, phylogenetic trees as you're sequencing specimens in the collections and having that to anchor, to know by carbon dating and things like that, um, the various nodes of those uh, evolutionary trees. It, your collections there really span a lot of information. Um, is there anything particularly just super unique uh, at the museum, a specimen, a, some kind of example that uh, you always, when you're maybe giving behind the scenes tours or something like that, you love showing to uh, visitors? Well, um, there, you know, there are things that I like to show because they're interesting from my own research perspective. And there are also things that are interesting in their own inherent right. You know, we've got several extinct specimens that I like to show ivory billed woodpeckers, for example, where, you know, we can actually now, maybe we can't see these in the wild, but we can go and sequence their genomes from, you know, small samples from these skin specimens, which is pretty cool. Um, I often like to show the humble house finch of which is perhaps people don't think of as a very exciting bird, but um, uh, has been a big part of my own genetics research in, in using museum collections collected before and after they, they got a new disease. So something we can all appreciate right now, a disease in chickens jumped to house finches in 1994 and killed up killed off to 60% in some areas. So understanding how did house finches evolve resistance to this new disease by sequencing them before and after, you know, this major event happened. Um, so, you know, different ways that even common birds actually can be really useful in the collection. Sometimes it's not a question of one individual, although, you know, there are, there are objects throughout our collections that have fantastic individual stories. And those are always fun for tours but areas in which the museum has a strength for somewhat random historical reasons. Um, one of those is our bird skeleton collection. This happens to be an area that our museum is very strong in that many museums didn't put a lot of emphasis on collecting. And so when we, when we look at our collections as a whole, sometimes the most interesting and exciting parts are things that you wouldn't realize are even unique to us, but are. Um, and Allison maybe can talk a little bit more about, the, about this skeleton, which I can't even identity of it. Yeah, so this skeleton is a, a southern ground hornbill, so something that was collected in Tanzania, I believe. Um, and this is an example of, you know, we, when we're scoring, when we store research specimens, just like when we store the skin specimens, we don't like taxidermy them because of space reasons and making them useful for research. You know, our skeletons are also just disarticulated bones in a box, essentially. And one of the reasons that we have such a good skeleton collection, we've got about 17,000 complete bird skeletons is because of the Librea tar pits. So how do you identify what comes out of the tar pits? Well, you have to have something to compare it against. And so that actually, you know, some one of my kind of forthcoming new research directions is to actually work on some of these many hundreds of thousands of unidentified bird skeletons um, and apply new technologies. So one thing we're, we're trying to do is we're actually um, using our uh, the collections of birds that we're, where we know what they what they are so our bird skeleton collection 
and trying to build machine learning algorithms to actually identify unknown skeletons. And so, you know, that way, what, you know, one of the things about having a great, great series of birds is we can actually build a training data set, something that's very necessary for machine learning. And then we can um, apply that to the La Brea Tar Pits material and hopefully start to get some IDs. And so, you know, that, that way we'll actually know something about what the bird community was actually like, you know, 10,000, 40,000 years ago. And one way that we often travel back in time with birds, because birds actually don't fossilize particularly well, their bones are, are hollow, so they often, you know, it's really hard to find good bird fossils, is we do it with genetic data. So we have, you know, genetic algorithms that we can use to say, okay, this population probably, you know, was really small at this point in time or really big. Um, we can make inferences based on where specimen locations are made. And so we can actually start to ground truth some of those models with the information about the bird communities in the tar pits. And that will help, help us to have much more accurate models to project into the future. And so that's you know kind of one exciting way that we're using this amazing skeleton collection that we have um, and applying some new technologies to it that's gonna you know, give another collection kind of additional life. When we, when we talk about um, new technologies and DNA, if you can go forward one more. Um, I want to mention also that there's a lot of work being done in collections that are not as well known as our bird collection. So birds and mammals, um, there historically have been relatively a lot of scientists and there are relatively few species. So we know quite a lot about the contents of our collections and we know quite a lot about the species in the world. And that's not true for some other things, particularly for invertebrates. And so what you're seeing here is an image from one of our marine biodiversity labs um, with some, some sorting of specimens going on. Um, this is one of the places where our researchers are getting into techniques like um, environmental DNA. So not just taking a DNA sample from a known specimen of bird, but taking a DNA sample from a seawater sample and running that and using the water, which has little tiny traces of, of various animals and plants that passed by um, to look at the whole contents. And that's a technique that is really exciting for places like rainforests or um, tundra communities that are not well described, where we can get a huge amount of information with new technology from a really, really tiny and not very destructive sample. But also add that, you know, having this library of specimens that we can sequence will is going to be really important so that you can actually identify what these sequences are coming from um, or, you know, relatives of what they're coming from. So you really need kind of both, both sides in order to be successful in that. Yeah, museums, museums serve a really important role as a reference collection for some of these exploratory projects where you have to have something that is already identified in order to know what it is that you are now seeing, that whether you're identifying it with some kind of traditional morphological analysis or DNA barcoding or this kind of environmental DNA. Um, if, you, if, if we don't have anything to compare it to, you just have a DNA sequence. I think that's a uh, great, very, very uh, full spectrum in terms of how many, how many specimens and all the data that the museum has to offer and a variety of different avenues for research. Um, we can continue talking. I'd love to uh, tell our audience that uh, we'll begin taking questions throughout the remainder of this conversation. So please feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A function. And as those questions come in, uh, we'll, we'll field those depending on the topic and maybe spur more conversation. Um, but certainly, I think uh, one thing on the X Prize side, especially the X Prize Rainforest, um, is these aspects of eDNA and machine learning. And, you know, we're dealing with the most complex ecological terrestrial environments um, on the planet with just immense amounts of biodiversity. And, um, it's, it's a lot of data to collect. And then once you collect it, it's a huge amount of data to analyze. Um, and I'm sure that one 
aspect at, at your museum is just uh, people power and being able to process all of the specimens that you have. And there's almost infinitely many projects that can be conducted from the collections that you have. And it's a matter of uh, time and resources. And, um, but there are so many questions that you can ask. And uh, so I, I love hearing about other natural history museums and, and what you have there, what makes it unique and the research that you're doing from these, you know, just super valuable libraries. We have a couple questions coming in. Yeah, I, um, I see one in the chat. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a question about whether we have plans for offsite storage facilities, and not only do we have plans, we have offsite storage facilities. Uh, we didn't we didn't talk about those tonight, um, but we do have specimens in a couple of different places that are not our main building, and that's because it is the nature of museum collections to grow over time, and we can do what we can to store them more efficiently, but really eventually you do run out of space, and so that's that's something we'll you know continue finding more space for. Um, the other part of this question is whether the retention of physical specimens ever becomes unnecessary with digitization. And the answer to that is a resounding no, because there is information that it is impossible to digitize, and there's information that might be possible to digitize, but that we don't know about yet. And so DNA is one example of that. We didn't know, you know, in the 1800s, scientists didn't know that DNA existed. They could have done what they could then to digitize specimens, you know, by, I don't know, sketching them or something. You couldn't do much to digitize specimens in the 1800s. And they could have tossed them. And think what we would have lost. And so as we as museum professionals look forward, we have to think there is something that we haven't discovered yet that these specimens are going to be used for. And so we're keeping them in part because of the things we know about DNA, morphological measurements that you can only get from a real specimen, stomach contents that you can only get by analyzing a real specimen, but also for the, those unknown questions. And so part of what museums are doing is creating this archive for unknown purposes, you know, another 200 years in the future. Yeah, that's a great point. And even, even in the advent of genetic uh, methods, you know, 10 years ago, we were doing CO1 barcoding and, you know, single genes or multiple genes. And then years later, we realized you could use the same specimens oftentimes uh, or recent specimens and do genomics. And so going back into collections and pulling more tissue um, from those resources. So it is the, the unknown. <laughs> Um, one, one question that I have, Allison, you mentioned the ivory billed woodpecker, and uh, I always enjoy seeing those in collections. I'm curious if uh, either of you in, in your time going through the collections over the years, has anything ever been, have you ever been surprised or found something in the collection that you never expected? I know that uh, it's so often, especially like in entomology with insects, to go through collections and actually have newly described species that are just hidden in there um, that just nobody's gotten to yet. But what kinds of surprises have you found? That's, that's a hard one. I mean, you know, one of my favorite things is just going through the collections because you're, you always get surprises, you know, even if they, maybe they're small or maybe they're big. Um, so for example, you know, it's, it's, less likely to go out and discover a new species of birds, but actually one way that people are actually describing new species of birds is by um, a sequencing museum specimens and learning that, hey, these two things that actually look really similar, really similar are actually really genetically distinct from each other. And so that's not something that you're going to do by just kind of pulling open drawers. But, you know, one of one of the things that I, one of my specialties is also plumage color. So I always you know, when I feel like getting some inspiration, just kind of opening up these drawers and looking at the specimens, you know, I'll kind of realize, hey, the pattern, you know, the patterns on this species are actually really similar to this species, which lives is a, in a completely, in a very similar area, but maybe are completely distantly related for each other. And that might, you know, generate some new questions in terms of thinking about how, how that color has evolved, for example. Um, and, 
you know, yeah, there's, there's just always, always new things to learn. On that note, I'd love to bring up um, Darwin's finches. And, <laughs> um, you know, what if, can you, can you go into that in a little detail, Allison, with your work on um, tanagers? And what would have happened if everything were just based on illustrations from the 1850s um, versus what you were able to do with genetics now? Oh yeah, I mean, so one thing is that Darwin's finches are not actually finches. You know, we've actually using genetic techniques shown that Darwin's finches are actually a type of tanager. So, you know, just learning about how things are related to each other, we've learned that actually um, these traits like morphology might not be good predictors of, of which species are actually closely related to who. So Darwin's finches are one example of that. Um, another example I love to share are the tanagers that we find in kind of North America. So think like the Western tanager or the scarlet tanager, or the summer tanager. These things, it turns out when you look at them in a, what we call a phylogeny or like a family tree of how these species are related from a genetic perspective, turns out they're actually cardinals. They're not tanagers at all. And this has occurred throughout many of these bird clades. We're finding out different birds are related to each other or not related. And that, that completely changes um, you know, how we're thinking about evolution. So for example, we, you know, when gen genomes kind of came out, we learned that, that grebes and flamingos were actually really close relatives to each other. That wasn't something that anybody predicted or that hummingbirds are actually really they're nested in this you know, semi-nocturnal group of birds called um, 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 things like night jars and, go and goat suckers and caprimulgids, if you know those. Um, swifts are really close to them, but you know, thinking about that, that's what we need in order to kind of understand the backbone of you know, how this diversity actually evolved. And those, you know, Allison and I are both uh, evolutionary biologists with, with a background in DNA, so we're leaning on a lot of DNA examples. But these, these surprises happen with any analysis you can name. Um, as soon as a, a scientist comes up with a clever new way of looking at these specimens, whether that's a new kind of anatomical analysis or um, some kind of stable isotopes that lets you look at what things we're eating, you find surprises and that's part of what, why science is so fun because we don't know what's out there and there are so many unanswered questions. Absolutely. It looks like we have another great question here. Um, can you share some of your hopes for how museums might look different in the future? Any particular advancements you're eager to see? Hmm. Well, I would, you know, one thing I'm really hoping for kind of advances in digitization. So, um, you know, one thing I want to do is take photographs of all of our bird specimens from both the, the visual part of the spectrum, but also the ultraviolet because birds can actually see an ultraviolet. Um, and there's some, some kind of new techniques that are being developed, um, including some from our colleagues up at Occidental, just up the road, to actually kind of 3D image bird specimens. And so I think, you know, there are some really, really exciting ways to kind of increase the visibility of collections and get them just get them more widely available around the world without having to have the physical specimens, although the physical specimens are still really incredibly important and useful. Um, I'll also say that, you know, we're, we're not, the collections are not done. We're still collecting specimens. And so I think also really um, highlighting that I hope to see collections continue to grow. You know, the way that we're getting specimens might be a little bit different from mostly through salvage. So, you know, birds that are found dead or working with wildlife rehabilitators. We also, when you go on, you know, when we go work in other countries, for example, in rainforests, we're gonna work with collaborators down there and the specimens are gonna stay in those countries as well. So, you know, that just highlights the importance of, of having these specimens be really um, easily visible for, you know, and kind of easy to access from anywhere. On the human side, I wanna say also that I hope that museums will look different in the future in having a more diverse staff and probably also a more diverse visitors. Um, museums as an industry have a little bit of a problem on both of those sides. Um, collections, because um, collection staffs are quite small in general, 
there don't tend to be a lot of entry level job opportunities. There tends to be some very specific and somewhat strange training um, that we need people to have had. Um, and that doesn't make it a very welcoming field. Um, so there, there are some things I hope we can do to change that so that anybody who thinks that this stuff is cool, who thinks that it would be fun to database birds um, could get a foot in the door and come work with us. Um, and right now it's a little bit too hard for that to happen. Absolutely. That's critical. And I, I love Allison's point as well about, um, you know, many countries now you do in terms of continuing collections, uh, partnering with local institutions and working with local universities and researchers and um, having those voucher specimens that you're, you know, sharing amongst institutions so that those collections can also grow in, in countries where those species exist. So there are, there's so many different factors and um, yeah, I, I think that museums are, are turning in, in many different ways currently. So um, it looks like we have another question in here from a time travel point of view. What kind of analysis can or has been done on bird songs since vocalization cannot be fossilized or can it? That's, that's a great question. Um, so vocalizations can't be fossilized themselves, right? But but there actually are growing collections of bird vocalizations and, and images and other types of digital data. So, you know, some museums will archive these um, and actually, you know, some museums will try and attach to the physical voucher specimen recordings of that same individual or photos of that individual if they're not archived in like the Macaulay, um, the Macaulay collection at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a great example of a digital bird collection. Um, and, you know, and even though bird vocalizations can't be fossilized, they're the, the parts of the bird that produce the vocalization. So the, the syrinx, um, that is something that you can get from, from certain types of specimens. And so that could be a way to, to try and infer at least parts of how a bird might vocalize um, from kind of, you know, deeper time perspective. There's also a lot of um, inference of the past that we can do with specimens rather than, you know, sometimes, sometimes you can't directly observe the past if you don't have a fossil that, that has the right character. But this is what we do with evolutionary trees as well. So I, I'm not a birdsong person, but as, a, as an evolutionary biologist, I would guess that if you build a tree of birds and start looking at what the patterns are and analyzing the patterns of modern bird bird songs, you are going to learn something about ancestral birds and bird song. And if you have fossils to link to that tree, you can find out when those things were happening and when things were changing. So there's some inferential techniques as well as direct techniques for looking at the past. One question that I have is um, during the time of uh, COVID right now, how might you, has, has research on collections changed? How might you be able to, how do you envision, um, you know, we're not able to travel to the field right now in many respects to collect more specimens. Um, do you see this being an opportunity to even dive deeper into collections and gain more out of them since you have them right there? Or how do you envision this field kind of evolving in itself um, given the times that we're in? It, for one thing, it is really kind of lighting a fire under us with respect to digitizing collections, because suddenly we have a need for our own collections to be available to us online in a way that hasn't always been true. We have a lot of staff who are, who are working from home, and the specimens are still in the museum, and we wish that more data were available to us. Um, otherwise, it, this hasn't been great for the kinds of research that we do in terms of travel and loaning specimens. Um, we usually have visitors um, to the museum um, behind the scenes looking at specimens and we can't have that right now. So there's a lot of projects that have been put on hold just because of the realities of the pandemic. And then that aside, um, I imagine typically I'm sure that you have a huge educational um, element of visitors that typically come to the museum and, and see the collections and stuff like that. Um, could you speak a little bit to how 
uh, the public is informed from the collections that you have and what opportunities the museum has in that respect? Yeah, so, you know, the, the public will come to the museum. That's actually, you know, thinking about opportunities in this kind of day and age is that it, while we can allow, you know, researchers to come back behind the scenes, um, it's hard to allow large numbers of the public back behind the scenes, you know, for, for various reasons. And so, you know, in, in this time when everybody is, is living so virtually, that's actually an opportunity for us to maybe highlight some of the things that people wouldn't normally be able to see in, in a, you know, in a physical way anyway. And so just, you know, like we were kind of giving a somewhat virtual behind the scenes tour in, in this talk, you know, we have the opportunity to do more kind of ways to engage with the public um, and also, you know, kind of come up with ways for, for educators or the public to actually use our data. You know, our data are not just available to researchers, but to anybody. So anybody can go search our collections and learn about, you know, what's around them without, you know, what's around them, with, what's around them now or what's been around them in the past. And so I think, you know, getting the public more engaged in the data side um, is one way that, you know, we can engage the public and in, in especially in kind of today's day and age. Absolutely. With only just a couple minutes left, um, we can take any last questions. I was just curious if either of you have any last remarks that you wanna share about the collections or um, you know, anything unique about it just before we, we close this conversation. I'm not. I'm not sure how to how to put all the other, all the things we haven't said about museum collections into into one pithy so sentence. Um, this um, for all the for all the potential X Prize participants out there. I hope we've convinced you that this is a resource that maybe is worth looking at um, and something that could be useful for the kinds of exploration of biodiversity that you're thinking about. Absolutely. So we hope you'll get in touch if that's the case. No, that's great. That's a great segue. Um, and for the Rainforest X Prize, I think we've touched on a, a number of relevant aspects to our um, competing teams and, and how machine learning, how collections, how um, skeletons and genetic data and eDNA and all of these different aspects, um, and even house cats. It finally <laughs> came out, Allison. Um, <laughs> All of these different aspects of the Natural History Museum, how how they can be utilized to support, um, you know, for data being collected now, so much of that needs a reference collection. So much of it needs to be calibrated on um, what biodiversity, what we already know about biodiversity. So, um, museum collections are are phenomenal for that, and certainly. Um, you all have a brilliant one in Los Angeles, um, and it's been a pleasure uh, speaking with both of you tonight and learning more about the collections there. I personally hope that uh, in a time post-COVID or whatever the era is that comes after that, that I can uh, visit, and, and personally, I'm going to be uh, contacting both of you to get a behind-the-scenes tour. Um, for those interested in learning more, please check out the Natural History Museum's uh, page. And for the Rainforest X Prize, you can check us out at rainforest.xprize.org or email us at rainforest.xprize.org. Um, Trina and Allison, it was an absolute, absolute pleasure. And I, I'm really looking forward to uh, speaking more with you throughout the future and also continuing our, our X Prize Natural History Museum series um, in the future, our Tropical Thursdays. So thank you both very much and uh, hope you have a great night. Thank you to our yeah. attendees as well for joining in. We really appreciate it. Thanks, it's been thanks. fun. Yep. Yeah, thanks Peter, it's been great. All right, take care.